Hello and welcome to the Lost Caverns of Ixalan colorless limited set review. Also, there are lands in here. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about those cards and you know how good I think they're going to be in limited. This often, this section often consists of very many bad cards because they're colorless, and for whatever reason, Wizards doesn't like printing good colorless cards. I assume there's design reasons behind this, um, uh, but you know. We'll talk about them anyways, because they do matter, and there are a significant number of lands and caves that we're going to be talking about today. If you haven't been here before, this is how I rate the cards. Uh, tier 1 is the good stuff, Tier 5 is the bad stuff. Uh, you can read what the descriptions are, like, you know, I made some fancy descriptions for what they mean, but that's you know, generally tier The lower the number is better, basically, is my, my view on it. I'll pick up on that pretty quick. So, Buried Treasure. Two colorless mana for a treasure. You can sacrifice it to add one mana of any color, and you can pay five and exile it from your graveyard to discover five. Activate only as a sorcery. I have this in tier four because the front side is so bad, um, but the back side is actually kind of interesting, um, and I do, I do hold out some hope that there could be like a deck that's like I, I do hold out some hope that there's like a deck that's like oh I want to mill this and put it in my graveyard and I get free value and I get to exile it and I get to discover five. Um, again, Discover 5 and Limited, um, not really substantively better than a Discover 4, to be honest, like, because most Limited decks, like, you're just going to hit something that costs less than 5 so much more often that, like, it doesn't, you know what I mean? So, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's fine. You may be a bit overpaying, like, you're overpaying kind of on both sides of this card, which concerns me. It is an artifact, but... You know, there's only so far that the type line can take you, you know. Careening Minecart. Three colorless mana for a 3-3 vehicle with crew 1. When it enters the battlefield, or when it attacks, create a treasure token. It does not enter the battlefield and create a treasure token. That would actually be a good card. Um, I really like this card, actually. Um, it comes with all the, the baggage of being a vehicle, but it, you know, you play this on 3, you play two 2 drops on 4, one of the 2 drops crews this, you get to make a treasure, you get some mana, you get an artifact. I, really, I don't know, I think, I, think, I think you probably will play this in pretty much any deck, um, just because it, you know, it reminds me, it's like Raider's Carve. It's probably a better version of Raider's Carve from Kaldheim, where, where the carve came in and it would, like, ramp you sometimes. Um, but this just, like, always ramps you. Uh, it's a little smaller, but it's a smaller crew as well, so... I think it's pretty solid. I think it's a solid card. I like it a lot. Photographer's Companion. Three colorless mana for a 2-1. When it enters the battlefield, you create a map token. Map, map tokens are very good. Artifacts are very good. That does not make a 3-mana 2-1 a real card, unfortunately. Um, I don't think a map token is worth, like, three stat points. If this if this were a 3-2, I still think... It would probably be good. Actually, if this were a 3-2, it would be good. I actually... I, that yeah, Just, like, ignore what I was saying. But I don't think map tokens are good enough to make up for two two stat points, especially an attack point here. Um, this is a 2-3 I still don't think would be very good. As a 3-2 I think it would be good, but as a 2-3 I, I still wouldn't be super enticed. Um, if it was a 3-1 I'd be like, mm, interesting, interesting, you have me interested. I'm not interested though, I think it's fillery garbage. Chimel the Inner Sun. Um... Six mana for a legendary artifact. Spells you control can't be countered. At the beginning of your end step, discover five. Which, as I said, is pretty much just the same thing as discover four. But Look, man, is this actually a tier one card? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be real with you. It probably is not, but it is extremely fun, and there's no way I'm not taking it. Like, it's a tier one card, because it rocks. So, <laughs> whether it's actually this good or not, like, who cares? Like, this card's just a slot machine and again like there is some artifact removal in the set so like that is like, a problem but you do get immediate value right you do get to discover five at your end step you probably hit like a th on average you're hitting like a three drop and then you know in two turns you've made up your six mana your opponent probably isn't you know going to kill you fat that fast and then it just starts to like sort of take over the game because you are doing stuff again Tier 1, probably a bit high. It should probably be Tier 2, but I, I like it too much to put it in Tier 2 because I'm, you know, I'm a man, I'm a man of passion, you know? I, I truly, you know, I want there to be one good colorless card, okay? Is it too much to ask? Compass Gnome. Two colorless mana for a 2-1. When it enters the battlefield, you may search your library for a base clan card or a cave card. 
reveal that card and shuffle it and put that card on top. So we've seen this several times, uh, Strixhaven and Phyrexia Albi 1. The Phyrexia Albi 1 version, there were some individuals, degenerate individuals, that thought that card was like, fine? I, I, sure, I guess? I don't know. Uh, wild. Wild takes, in my opinion. That card was truly awful. Um, And uh, this card I don't expect to be much better. Yes, the artifacty nature of it is nice, and yes, it finding like again in the cave deck maybe you want this. I'm just not a believer in the cave deck. So someday, if if somebody shows me the cave deck, I'll be like, I'm in, I'm in. But you know, if until somebody shows me the cave deck, I'm just gonna be I'm just gonna be a skeptic. I'm just gonna continue to be skeptical because that's my nature. Okay. I like that the. the I like that it's a gnome though, so that's that's that it has a that going for it. Oh no, my mouse, my mouse died. It's fine. Contested game ball, two colorless mana for an artifact. Whenever you're dealt combat damage, the attacking player gains control of contested game ball and untaps it. You can pay two and tap it to draw a card and then put a point counter on contested game ball. Then, if it has five more point counters on it, sacrifice it and create a treasure token. This card is really cool. However, Allowing your opponent to just steal it immediately is really bad. Obviously, you're not going to play it when that happens. But the problem is, then you aren't playing your card. So that's bad. Like, you can play this on turn two, but then your opponent goes two drop haste, and it's like, well, <laughs> haha, I guess I lose. This, this is kind of like a, a toned down version of the Monarch, um, which is like a cool, it's a cool way of doing that sort of effect. Um, the Monarch is very powerful. It's a very powerful effect in limited being the monarch, um, and having this this type of like you know whatever draw to pay two mana to draw a card type style effect is usually very good. However, your opponent being able to steal it without like because your opponent knows whether they can take it better than you do. I think maybe you have to make some bad blocks. I don't know. I think just the the downside is too high. I think it's just too high. Um, I do love that like it's I. Um, what is this? This is called like top down design. I do love this design. It's like my favorite designed card in the set. Really cool. Like it a lot. Um, I kind of wish they'd given it the extra juice and just let it be one tap draw card. You know what I mean? Just give it, just give it, a, just give it a little extra nudge. You know, just give it some juice, right? But uh, yeah, not to be unfortunately. But yeah, it's it's really cool. So I hope it's good, but I don't think it's very good. Dig Site Conservator, two colorless mana for a 2-1. You can sacrifice it and exile up to four target cards from a single graveyard. Activate only as a sorcery. And when it dies, you may pay four if you do discover four. So that's nice. I think paying four to discover four is a much better rate than paying five to discover five, for reasons I've gone over. You get to control when it dies, at least a little bit. Um, exiling four cards from a single graveyard. I know it's only at sorcery speed, but whatever, man. Turn it, like... The fact that this card exists is kind of just the worst ever. Because if you're a deck, that, deck that's like, oh, yes, let's go, I got to send four on, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to go, and then your opponent plays this, you're just like, oh, I just lose the game instantly on the spot, all my cards don't do anything. <laughs> so, it's kind of a nightmare. Um, yes, you only get to activate as a sorcery, so you have to, like, choose, but on turn four, like, you can play this on turn two, and then your opponent's like, well guess I don't want to put stuff in my graveyard to enable my deck. And then on turn four, like, you can sacrifice it and discover four. Pretty good. You know, I, I like this card quite a bit. Um, I do think you should play it. I don't, again, you, there are diminishing returns, obviously, like, you don't want a ton of these, because they, you know, are below rate, but the the turning off your opponent's graveyard and making it garbage thing is actually, like, pretty real, in my opinion. Disruptor Wander Glyph, four colorless mana for a 3 4. When it attacks, exile a target card from opponent's graveyard. F, no, garbage, don't want this. How is it ever attacking? Don't know. Not even going to talk about it. Hoverstone Pilgrim, five colorless mana for a 2 5 flying ward 2. You can pay two to put a card from a graveyard on the bottom of its owner's library. No, not good. And we talked about how graveyard disruption is good. Yes, it is, but not paying two mana to do it. <laughs> not paying two mana for this really, really bad. I mean, it's not that bad, right? Look, you will tune into Sand Black Stream, and you will see him utilizing this card, and it will be good. He will he will make it look good. That does not mean that it is good. It means that he is good at playing with it, okay? <laughs> I 
He'll he'll be he'll have decked himself. It'll be like this is Epitaph Golem 2.0, whatever. It's better Epitaph Golem. Um, it has flying. That's kind of nice. But yeah, don't don't play this in like your right, random limited deck. Hunter's Blowgun. Single colorless mana for an equipment. Equipped creature has plus one plus one. It has death touch as long as it's your turn. Otherwise, it has reach. This is a prime example of what I like to call equipment cowardice. Equipment cowardice is when Wizards of the Coast prints equipment that is completely unplayable instead of just making it have one lower equip cost and seeing if maybe it would be okay. But they're like, nope, can't do that. Can't have colorless equipment be good. Just can't have, just, we can't have common equipment be good. It's not legal. It's actually not allowed. We don't want it. We actually don't want it. So, like, I guess, here's my question, right? If we're just gonna have common equipment be bad, why put it into the set? Like, why? Like, people are gonna play this card, and it's gonna be medium to bad, and it is just a trap, and it's colorless, so people think they can just put it in every deck. I feel like it's just awful design. To be, to be honest with you, like, I just, I don't get it. I genuinely do not understand why they print cards like this, where it's like, it's bad for, like, people that are newer to the game, because they're like, oh, it's colorless, I can go in any deck, and so therefore it's good to, like, take early, and, like, put in, like, because when you hear, like, people talk about, like, oh, staying open, I want to take cards that allow me to go in any of my decks, so I can, like, always play them. You think about cards like this, but actually this card's just really bad. It's like, oh, but it's equipped two, and it gives these abilities that, like, do stuff, and plus one, plus one. <sighs> I don't know. I, I, like... I just, I wish that we would just push the boundaries a little, like, there's so much power creep in, like, regular creatures, and there's just, we just keep seeing equipment like this, where it's like, equip, you could just make it equip one. I understand, like, Short Sword isn't even that good. Short Sword isn't even that good of a card. I understand that you would just be like, there's like, there are cards in this set that are basically just Short Sword that are worse than this. Would this, would this even be good if you, if you made it equip one? I don't think so. I think it would be like a tier three card. I'd bump it up two full tiers, but that's just because I would have, like, some optimism. I would be like, oh, it's cool, it, like, they finally made some, did some iteration on, like, this formula for this card, and, you know, now it's got some interesting abilities with reach and death touch, and it, like, actually play, like, you can move it around and give, but, you know, I, I, I as it stands, I just think this card is really bad. I'm not going to bother reading the name of this card. Three colorless mana for an artifact. You can tap it to draw a card and then discard a card. Sure. And then you can pay four and tap it and transform it. Activate only if there are four or more permanent types among cards in your graveyard, which should be easier than you might think. Um, anyways, Fathom Descent, add X mana of any one color where X is the number of permanent cards in your graveyard. So you can make a bunch of mana. Don't know how you're spending that mana, but you can certainly make a bunch of mana. Yes, a craft cards are expensive, but you're paying four up front, and it's tapped when it enters the battlefield, so... Not super excited. If it was just pay four and then you didn't have to tap this, I'd be like, okay, because you could get that mana right back. But you uh, you can't get the mana right back. Um, now you can get the mana right back, obviously if you know you do it on your opponent's turn. But then you know you're. Uh... That's actually the way you would do this, but it, it also doesn't like again. I don't think that. I don't think you can just be like again. I'm I'm just I always, with ramp stuff like this. It's always like, do did you draw the one thing in your deck that uses all this mana? If you didn't, then you're transforming. It's really bad. Um, and also through the the front part is just too is too expensive. Like three mana to just loot every turn. Like yeah, it's fine. It's nice to have cards in your yard again for like descend and stuff. But I don't know. Three mana no board impact. Just it scares me off. And I, I'm not super high on this. Roaring. Throne. Four colorless mana for a 4 4 word 2, and it enters the battlefield, choose a creature type. It is the chosen type in addition to its other types. If a creature, a triggered ability of another creature you control of the chosen type triggers, it triggers an additional time. So you're probably going to be choosing like dinosaur or pirate or merfolk, because um, those are the, the, the tribes that actually like do something in this set. Um, gnome, maybe, also might be one. I don't know. Um, but yeah, this is just like four mana four four colorless colorless like four mana four four ward two, and sometimes you get to trigger additional abilities. But like four mana four four ward two isn't like the worst like nightmare ever. Like it's not bad. 
again, the, the reason this is in tier 2 is actually the thing I talked about earlier, where it's like, you, you can just pick it, and it goes in your deck. Obviously, for you can load up on 4 drops to the point that you don't really want this, but whatever. Like, it's colorless, you know, it probably makes your deck, you know, it's a good card, and that's why I have it rated so highly. Um, so, yeah. Runaway Boulder, 6 colorless mana for a f artifact with flash. When it enters the battlefield, it deals 6 damage to target creature and opponent controls. You can also pay 2 to cycle it. I am starting low on this card, as you can see, by it being in tier 4. However, I do also kind of like it. Um, you know, cycling is better in this set than in the average set. Just because it puts stuff in your graveyard. Having late game flexibility when you can, like, deal 6 to something, and then you don't care. Like, once this deals 6 to something, you don't care about it anymore, so you can use it to craft or whatever. Like... I do actually think this card may have a place in some decks. Um, the the price tag is you know is a little high. It, it does the price tag scares me on this card. If it was like five mana deal five, I'd be much more interested. I'd be like, ooh, this this looks really nice. Six is a lot of mana. Um, you do get the extra damage. Um, you know, I, I certainly have some hope for this card. I do like I do like this design. Um, unlike some of the other colorless designs, I think this is actually very well designed. I think there's a lot of interesting like there's a lot of ways that their set could unfold that this actually could be a good card and a playable card, and I certainly think that it may have a place in the format. But I am starting low on it because, you know, it gets taxed for being six mana. Scampering Surveyor. Four mana for a three two uh, when it enters the battlefield, search your library for a basic land card or a cave card, put it onto the battlefield, tapped, and then shuffle. If you are playing the cave deck, you want this card because it basically is drawing you a card, and because it is a cave in a cave deck, you want it. You, if you are not playing the cave deck, you don't want this card at all. I mean, I mean, if you think about it like this, right? So, you're ramping, right? So it's 4 mana 3 2 to add an additional land to the battlefield. If you have a cave to get... That's good, because A, you're making the cave enter the battlefield essentially untapped, because you're getting it for free, and that is essentially equivalent to drawing a card in the late game. A 4 mana 3-2 is not that bad. It's not that bad. It is an artifact as well. Um, I guess, like, the question is, am I playing this in a deck that only has, like, three caves? And the answer is, like, maybe. Right? Because the, the, the common cave cycle, which we'll talk about in a bit, you know, they're, they're pretty good. Uh, they discover, you can sacrifice them. There's six mana to discover, basically. Um, you do have to sacrifice the land. So, you know, I mean, that's not the best ability ever on planet Earth, but it's not bad either. So, I don't know. I, I like this card at least a little bit. Sorcerer's Spyglass. Um, you know, it's a reprint. Two colorless mana. When it enters the battlefield, look at an opponent's hand that choose any card name. Activated abilities of sorcerers with the chosen name can't be activated unless they're banned abilities. Um, yep, this card is not a limited card. I'm going to not talk about it at all. Sunbird Standard. Three colorless mana for an artifact that taps to add one mana of any color. Craft with one or more for five. Uh, it transforms into a star star with flying vigilance and haste, and its power and toughness are each equal to the number of colors of among the exiled cards used to craft it. And for each color among the exiled cards used to craft Sunbird Effigy, add one mana of that color. You know, if you've ever played with Skyreach Manta, you know, kind of like a Skyreach Manta. Shout out Skyreach Manta. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I'm, the three mana mana rock tends to be pretty bad. At least, unlike some other things, it enables itself where you can pay, tap itself to pay the mana. And it exiles and comes back untapped, which is nice. So you basically, it's only it basically only costs four to craft this because you're you're paying you're getting one up front, right? Um, I think it's going to be really hard to make this like the fact I, like the backside having haste is actually really nice, and it has a vigil. So actually, you know, I'm I'm starting. You know what? The more I think about this card, the more I'm like, wait a minute. So I think tier five is probably a little low. Actually, the problem though is. You need to be playing three colors minimum in your deck. Two colors is not good enough. Um, and again, this is a five color fixer, so you want it to be fixing on the front side for five colors of mana. And then the problem, the real problem is like you don't really want to be like 
transforming your. I mean, it doesn't like trans. It doesn't get rid of the fixing, but it means your opponent can remove it with a removal spell, which is kind of, like it, it makes it more dangerous. Um, and it does. It's kind of, it, ramp, it can ramp and whatever. I don't know. I, I think this is bad, and I'm gonna treat it like it's bad until it's proven to me that it's not bad. Swashbuck glows whip single colorless mana for an equipment. Equipped creature has reach and two and tap and deal tap target artifact or creature. And eight tap and discover ten. Discover ten. Uh, might as well say discover five because it doesn't really get any like there's such high diminishing returns at after that point that it doesn't matter. Uh, so this, you're gonna you can basically just ignore both of the abilities on this because they are too expensive and don't do anything. And I think this card is awful. Tarian's Soul Cleaver. You can see that my equipment rant continues on this card, where I get mad at them designing bad equipment instead of making it slightly better. I don't know. It's just like either either just take it out of the game, like just either don't make print equipment cards or print good ones. I don't understand. Single colorless manner for an equipment. Equipped creature has vigilance whenever another artifact or creature is put into a game. Graveyard from the battlefield. Put a plus plus one counter on equipped creature, and it is equipped for two. Two, two, two. Equipped for two. Not equipped for one. Equipped for two. Excellent. Doesn't even, like, give any ad additional bonuses at the start, so it's just awful. It's bad. It's really terrible. Maybe in black-white you can play this and, like, do some sacrifice stuff, and it's kind of cool, but whatever. Like, this card's just awful. I hate it. The Millennium Calendar. Single colorless mana for a legendary artifact. Whenever you untap one or more permanents during your untap step, put that many time counters on the Millennium Calendar. Two and tap, double the number of time counters on the Millennium Calendar. When there are one thousand or more time counters on the Millennium Calendar, sacrifice it and each opponent loses one life. I love this card. Again, another exa example of top down design. You will see the rare question mark ranking on this card because I have no idea. Um. I'm pretty sure this card is awful. Now, if you play it on like turn five, untap all your stuff. That's basically like, thinking about it like this is lands. So you double it to ten on turn six, and then you double it to you know whatever thirty, and then you double like it just grows. It t it takes like ten turns to get there. You know what I mean? And most limited games are well and truly over by that point. The good thing is that it does kind of like catch itself up, right? Like if you play like if you play this on turn one, yeah, you get a little bit of an advantage, but not really, because you're not gonna be paying like I think this is card is terrible. To be honest with you, I do think this card's terrible. Um, you will probably lose to it. It's it is a card that is terrible, but you can certainly lose to if you just can't pressure your opponent in time because it will get out of hand pretty quickly especially if they can pay the two uh to do that consistently but it is a lot of mana to win um you know cool card but not uh not especially great or anything threefold thunderhulk seven colorless mana for a zero zero it enters the battlefield with three plus one plus one counters on it when it enters the battlefield or attacks, create a number of plus one plus one colorless gnome artifact creature tokens equal to its power. Um, and you can pay two and sacrifice another artifact and put a plus one plus one counter on it. So this card is just basically Mer Battlesphere, kind of. Um, Mer Battlesphere is very good. Uh, in limited, because, you know, <laughs> makes it, just, it just, just makes an enormous amount of things. Like, it's just, just so many things. And your opponent's like, well, now i got to deal with all these things. And they can't, because there's just too many of them. And then it attacks and makes more things. And you can, you know, pay, you can sacrifice it to make it bigger, so that it makes even more things, you know? Just doing kinds of, do all kinds of cool stuff. I really like this card. It's seven mana, so it's not tier one. But otherwise, really fun and interesting. Throne of the Grim Captain. Two mana for an artifact. You can mill two cards. And you can also craft with a dinosaur, merfolk, pirate, and a vampire to make this very large thing that wins the game almost immediately. And I'm not going to bother reading because who cares? You basically win. Um, I think it's going to be really, 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 really difficult to get all four of those types. Um, and as a result, the backside of this never happens. And you probably just lose. The interesting part of this card is how good is two mana artifact with the ability to just mill yourself for two every turn. And I think in some decks, that might be good enough. Now, 
I've put it in tier five anyways, because the idea of milling yourself for two every turn for like, like if you draw this on turn six, you die. Like it, <laughs> the best case scenario is you play this on two and you enable your stuff like early. I mean, honestly, the best case scenario is you have the two mana eight, eight, and then you like play this on two and then the two mana eight, eight on three. And then the, the eight, eight is on by turn four. Um, but Seems pretty unlikely, huh? Even then, it's like not that good, right? So that's that's why I have it in tier five. You're never gonna get like you're never this, the craft is never happening. Like whatever, like it's just, it's never it's literally never happening. So you know, be advised. Treasure map, two colorless mana for a artifact. You can tap one and tap to scry one. Put a landmark counter on treasure map. Then if there are three or more landmark counters on it. Remove those counters, transform it, and create three treasure tokens. And it transforms into the cove, which can tap for colorless mana, or you can sacrifice a treasure to draw a card and tap to tap it as well. Um, yeah, this is a really good card. Um, it's a good like cube card. It's not actually that great in cube anymore, especially the arena cube. It's kind of too slow these days, but um, certainly a good card in limited. Um, just just enables you to make treasure and you know scry and just sculpt your deck and all kinds of good stuff once this flips you kind of just win a lot because you get so much mana like you get all your mana that you invested back and it's only one like paying one mana is so much more doable than paying like any other amount of mana you know what i mean so yeah it's really solid we are on to the lands Captivating Cave. It is a land that can tap for colorless mana, or it it can pay one and filter mana, or you can pay four and sacrifice it to put two plus one plus one counters on target creature, activate only as a sorcery. That last ability you will never use, likely. I don't know. It does kind of remind you, you know, we just had Crystal Grotto. Grotto is like a tier four card. <laughs> Grotto, in some decks, is like a tier three card, but you know, again, you draft it like it's a tier four card, unless it's like you really know what you're doing. Um, look, if the five color cave deck is real, this card's going to be in that deck and it's going to be good in that deck. I just, you know, my expectations are not that that's going to be the case, but it could always happen. Cavender Souls. As Cavender Souls enters the battlefield, choose a creature type, add colorless mana, or you can tap to add one mana of any color, spend that mana only to cast a creature spell of the chosen type, and that spell can't be countered. Um, if you're in, like, red-green, you want this, but, like, I've, I've rated it in Tier 5, and the reason I've done that is that I'm never going to take it, and the reason I'm never going to take it is that somebody else is going to be drafting it before me. Like, somebody else is going to overrate this, so I'm just going to assume that I'm never taking it. Basically, I would only play this card if it wheeled, so. <laughs> um, it's obviously not that bad, but, you know, it, it, uh. It has its, um, you know, has its, uh, has its issues, right? Cavernous Maw. It's a cave. Uh, tap to add colorless mana, and you can pay two, and it becomes a 3-3 three, three creature in the of turn. It's still a cave. Activate only if the number of other caves you control, plus the number of cave cards in your graveyard is three or greater. Um, you need a lot of caves, but if you have a lot of caves... You know, it's a good effect to have on your caves if you if you have this. So again, you're gonna see a bunch of caves. Like there's gonna be a bunch of caves that are like I'm gonna rate them like tier three, whatever tier, and it's gonna be like, well, you know, the the issue with caves and with all land decks generally is that you have to spend actual picks on them, and then you don't have a functional deck. So that's the concern, and you will see it again here. You may have Echoing Deeps enter the battlefield tapped as a copy of any other land in a graveyard except it's a cave in addition to its other types. And you can tap to add colorless mana. Um, so again, cave stuff. Honestly, this one's probably worse than the last one. I should probably move it down to tier 4. But in caves, like you just want caves. In cave decks, you just want caves. This one actually like can maybe fix your lands if your opponent... like. Like if you like if you're milling stuff and your opponent mills and your opponent's putting stuff in their graveyard and like they put a land of a color that you need, this helps to fix your mana, kind of. Like somewhat unreliable fixing it is a cave for the cave deck. 
Um, yeah. Forgotten Monument. Another cave. You can tap to add colors mana. Other caves you control have. Pay one life, add one mana of any color. This is actually a really important card. If you're doing the cave five color deck, this card is... This is like the most important card that you could have. And the reason for that is that it just makes all your lands into City of Brass. And City of Brass, you know, you probably, because you don't have to always just pay one life, because the caves already can just pay to add colorless anyways. If you get two of these bad boys, I mean, you just, you can just cast every spell in the set. So, like, yeah, I mean, certainly, again, if the five color caves deck is to function, this is the reason why it will be functional. That's because it is, you know, fixing. This slide represents all of the um, common cave cycles that are tapped and discovered for four. Um, I have rated them all at tier three. I don't think there's a significant difference between any of the colors. I think they're, I mean, red and white are probably worse than black and blue and green, but like whatever, they're all basically the same. So I've all rated them all the same. Um, <laughs> Nothing else to say here. Pit of Offerings. Pit of Offerings enter the battlefield tapped. When it enters the battlefield, exile up to three target cards from graveyards. You can add a colorless mana, or you can add one mana of any of the exiled cards' colors. Tap lands are pretty bad, but exile your opponent's stuff from their graveyard to turn off their descend stuff is really good. Like, that's. Again, this is the type of stuff that I'm like, oh, Descend might be really bad. Like, you just might just get completely hosed by your opponent just running one uncommon land in the cave deck, and then they just totally blow you out, and you just can't do anything. Like, you're just, your deck becomes non-functional. Um, so I have I have a lot of, like, all of the, inc the Incidental Graveyard Exile makes me really concerned about the Descent stuff. Like... I don't think there's enough ways to enable it, and there's enough cards like this that disable it that I'm like, eee. you know? I don't know. I'm, I'm concerned. Promising Vein. Obviously a cave. Uh, you can tap to add colorless mana, or you can pay one and tap it to search uh, for a basic land card, put it under the battlefield, tap and shuffle. We saw this in Lord of the Rings, and it was awful. This is obviously better than that card because it's a cave, but, you know, not meaningfully enough that I'm thrilled to put it in my deck. Um, I'm going to be going through these lands. They are all rated the same, but I do have them separated out because they do different things. Um, there are the, the man lands. Um, they all enter the battlefield tapped. They all out tap for their two colors of mana. This one has one blue white tap and it becomes a two, three flying with blue, whatever. And it, um, when it attacks, you create a map token. So that's nice. This one is restless prairie. It has two green uh, white to be tapped to become a 3-3 three, three with um, whatever until it's a land. Jeez, I can't read these. What is wrong with me? Um, when it attacks, other creatures you control get plus one, plus one until end of turn. So, solid. Again, I have these all rated the same just because they're all, you know, creature lands. This one is blue and black, and it becomes a 4-4 four, four black shark creature token until end of turn. You can pay two blue black to do that. And when it attacks, target player mills four cards. Just not great, but fine. This is the red green one. It can become a three pay two red green to be a three four dinosaur. And when it attacks, another target attacking creature gets plus two plus so until end of turn. Untap that creature. So sure. Probably the worst one. This one's probably the worst one. But again, I'm just rating them all in tier two because they're good. Only when you know like. And then this is the red black version, and it's one black red for you know until it turn becomes a red insect creature with menace. It's still land. Um, when it attacks, you may discard a card if you do draw a card. Sure, probably like straight up just worse than the blue white one, but you know whatever. They're all fine. They're all decent. They're all playable. You'll you'll want if you're playing these two. If you know you're playing these two color pairs, they're pretty high priorities because they replace a land and they help fix your mana, which is really valuable. Sunken Citadel. It's a cave. It enters the battlefield tapped, and it chooses a color. You add one mana of the chosen color. Tap to add one mana of the chosen color. Or you can tap to add two mana of the chosen color. Spend this mana only to activate the abilities of land sources. I don't know. It's additional upside on a card that's already, you know, this type of effect, this type of land effect is already pretty good. You know, we've had Uncharted Haven and uh, the one we just had in the last set, uh, Edgewall Inn. Uh, this is not as good as Edgewall Inn, but 
you know, Edgewell End was like almost a tier one card. That card was cracked. Uh, activating the abilities of land sources is actually going to come up, as you've seen. There is like the cave deck, whatever stuff. Like, just really free fixing. Really nice to have, and you can put it in your deck no matter what. Volatile Fault. Um, it's a cave. You can tap to add one mana, colorless mana, and you can pay one and tap it to destroy target on basic land and opponent controls, which includes all of the caves. That player might search their library for a basic land card and put it into the battlefield, and you shuffle, you create a treasure token. I don't think you want to main deck this. It's like a slightly worse field of ruin. I think it's probably worse, because it gives you a treasure instead of a land. I don't know. In this particular limited format, it might be better, but I think it's just generally worse. Um, yeah, I don't know. Not super thrilled about this card. I just think land destruction's not very good. And it is the final card, so... I hope you've enjoyed me. Oh, no, I kicked my freaking desk. Um, <laughs> I hope you've enjoyed my journey through the, uh, the set review here. Um, if you enjoyed this video and you didn't see the other ones, feel free to go watch those. Um, see you.